Loving and righteous Father, we just come before you and we want to thank you so much, Lord, for another day of life. Thank you so much for, Lord, even the air we breathe, for our hearts that are still pumping. We are told in inspiration that there's not a battery placed within us, but you are constantly exercising your power to keep our hearts beating, to keep every part of our bodies functioning. So we just want to thank you so much for the gift of life. And Father, we know that life without Jesus is not worth living. And so we are also especially thankful for that wonderful gift. When you gave Jesus, you gave your all, you gave your best. You, had, you gave that which you only had. One of that which you only had was your son, Jesus. Thank you so much for that wonderful gift. And thank you so much, Father, that every drop of blood that fell from Jesus testified to us of unutterable love. We are so thankful for your mercies towards us that even when we have failed in different aspects of our lives, that your hand of mercy is still stretched out to save us. And not only is your hand stretched out to save us, to forgive us and cleanse us, but you have sufficient power to help us overcome those defects and those sins in which we are struggling. So thank you so much, Father, for all that heaven is currently doing for us. Thank you for the ministry of the angels. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that you are doing behind the scenes to work for our salvation. Father, I just pray may you help us to cooperate with you. Help us to forsake those things which are grieving your heart and bringing pain to your heart. Please help us to take a step higher in the ladder of sanctification and to become just like Jesus. Please may you bless this very short study and introduction into the sanctuary. And please may you draw every one of us closer to you, even those who will be viewing the study later. We love you, Father, and we ask these mercies humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, what we're going to do in the study, um, basically just an introduction into the sanctuary. So we're going to be studying the sanctuary, and then from there we're going to go, God willing, into the first, the second, and the third angel's message. So what we're going to do today is just introduce the sanctuary. Now I'm going to tell you that the great purpose of the sanctuary so actually, maybe before, let me not say that. I want us to look at a verse, and then I want us to build on this verse. It's a short study today. It's just the introduction. We might not even look at the sanctuary, but let's just go. Come in your Bible to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation the 10th chapter. Revelation chapter 10. Now, I want us to look at Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Now, in Revelation chapter 10, it's basically the whole Adventist movement. I'm saying this is one of the most powerful chapters that prove that the Adventist church is God's church. Even up to the disappointment that took place in 1844, it's all revealed in this chapter. But I want us to look at Revelation 10 specifically. I want us to see verse 7. Revelation 10, verse 7. Take note what the Bible says. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Now, let's just pause there. Now, how many seals are there in the Bible? Does anybody know how many seals are there? Seven. There are seven. <laughs> how many trumpets are there blown? Seven. There's, se there's only seven. So when it says, at the, it says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, this is talking about the seventh angel that sounds his trumpet. Let me ask you this. Is this the beginning of earth's history? Or is this the ending of earth's history? Think of it. It's just, if, if seven is the conclusion of the matter, and this is saying that this is the seventh angel, I'm asking, is this at the beginning of earth's history? Or is this at the ending? Because after the seventh, I don't know the eighth. Everything is, uh, the end. this is the end. This is the end. Now, I want you to see something interesting at the end of the world. When the world has come to its end, not so much, I don't believe the seventh angel sounds at the end, but I believe when he sounds, it's almost telling us that this world is not going to exist much longer. Now I want you to see, I want you to see when he sounds, there's a proclamation given with his sounding. In other words, when he sounds, this thing is going to be accomplished. What thing is going to be accomplished? And I believe this with all my heart, that when this thing is accomplished, Jesus throws down the sense in the sanctuary above. 
human probation closes. I'm telling you, everything hinges not even upon the mark of the beast. I'm telling you, the mark of the beast is only an effect of a course that takes place within God's church. A son, uh, the mark of the beast cannot be enforced unless this takes place first amongst God's people. And this actually, the effect is going to be so great that when this takes place amongst God's people, the whole world is going to be affected very shortly. It's not going to take years. It's going to take months or weeks that the whole earth is going to be affected by God's church. And it's not going to be the entire church of the Adventist movement. It's just going to be a small remnant within this church. But let's see Revelation 10 uh, verse 7. It says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, take note what happens when he sounds. Take note. It says, The mystery of God should be finished. Oh, friends, that is powerful. That is powerful. So the Bible says when the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God is going to be finished. Now, if I had a poet, I would write you a mystery of God. What is this? All I know is this, that when the angel sounds, whatever the mystery is of God, it's going to be finished. And when this proclamation is made, that God, your mystery is done, Jesus will cease to intercede. His mission now is accomplished. I want you to see, let's just finish the verse. It says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, in, if, if I was you, I would be asking, what is this thing that this, when this angel sounds, now I can give you a date when he sounded, but that, that's not my study now. There's a specific date he sounded on, and I can show you that from scripture, but you're not going to see it until we first laid this foundation, come back with part two, and then we can explain what date, but that's not really even our study. But nonetheless, when he sounds, it says that, the seventh, that when the seventh angel sounds, it says that the mystery of God shall be finished. Now, you know what question should be popping up in your mind? What is this mystery of God? What is this? Because when the angel sounds, the Bible is telling me that mystery is done. And I'm suggesting when that mystery is done, Jesus, I'm telling you, he comes back the second time. Human probation closes, seven last plagues come. Now, what is this mystery of God? I'm going to tell you that this seventh angel has sounded almost, not to the T, but almost a couple of months and it'll be 176 years. He sounded 176 years ago. He sounded. And the Bible says when he begins to sound, the mystery should be finished. Now what is this mystery? So if, if, if I'm correct, I'm saying we are living on borrowed time. Friends, do you know, do you know that this thing is supposed to be finished long time? We are living on borrowed time. Sister Jane, before I go and discover what's this mystery. Um, I'm going to take a guess. Yes. And uh, Revelation 11, verse 15, where they they say, the seventh angel says, there's loud voices that say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Sister Chen, thank you. This is powerful what you're doing. This is powerful. Now you, 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 you diverted me, Sister Chen. You diverted me. <laughs> but wait, wait. Now, what Sister Chen is... Yes, okay. You said something, Sister Chen. Okay. No, I just said sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now, you know what Sister Chen is doing now? She's making me explain now what is the seventh angel. When he's, when, when that she's diverting me there. I don't want to go there, but that's where she's pointing me. Go that side. But when the, the verse 15 is the introduction of the seventh angel sounding. Now, if, if you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm almost going to, I suggest that many of us are familiar with the sanctuary. So I'm going to, I'll just insert this. I don't want to insert it now, but I think we're familiar with the sanctuary. If I would put a picture here, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go where Sister Jen's pointing me, and then I'm going to go back to the mystery of God. So I'm going to go and see when did the seventh angel sound based upon the verse she directed me to. But before I do that, I just want to pull up um, something, just in case someone's here that don't know. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, there's a picture here of the sanctuary. There's a picture here of the sanctuary. Um, we're going to prove this 
as you see this layout here, in our next study, not today, in our next study, I can't just jump between to the sanctuary. I must first lay a foundation to show you why we must study this thing. Otherwise, you're not going to see the beauty. There's going to be no interest. So this study is just to introduce why we should study the sanctuary, why we should have an understanding of this, this magnificent, I'm going to say that when God thought of, like, only in finite wisdom could lay out, I'm going to just in, say, say now, only in finite wisdom through this, I would say this compacted prophecy. I'm going to call the sanctuary a compacted prophecy. He, he, a compacted, a small, through, through this, he shows us how he is going to redeem man. I said how he's going to redeem man. Through the sanctuary, this reveals every aspect of our redemption. But nonetheless, I'm going to ask someone who's already studied the sanctuary, just to tell me, what two apartments am I looking at? Just anyone who, who, who has some basic understanding of the sanctuary. What two apartments? But are we going to prove this? The holy and the holy most holy. Amen. Now, can someone tell me how many furnish, furni furniture is inside the most holy? How much? How many? None. Sorry? It's one. One. The Ark of the Covenant. Amen. The Amen. So... What we see inside the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant. That's all I wanted us to see. Let's close this. So that for now, just for now, that's all. Now, let's read the verse Sister Jane directed us to. My question to you is this. Oh, where's my book? My question to you is this. Maybe let's read it. Let's read it. And then I'll ask the question. Let's read it. Let's read it. I should ask the question. Let me ask the question. This is my question. Can you tell me, those who at least have who've studied before, so I'm asking, if you don't know, if, you, if someone's sitting there and they say, I, I don't know what's the holy and the most, I, it's fine, we're going to explain all those things, we're going to show the furniture, that's fine, don't worry about that. But also now, this is for a question with someone who has understanding of the sanctuary and, 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 and the judgment. Can anyone tell me, what year, we're going to prove this, but I'm just asking for now. What year did our great high priest enter into the most holy place? What year? October, 20, October 21st, 1844. October 22? 22, 1844. Amen. So that's in the year 1844. Now tell me, when the seventh angel sounds... Tell me, does the Bible give me a date? Not so much does it write down a year, but does it give me a, a, a prophetic event that I know that on this date, this event took place. Let's see. Now, sorry, Sister Michelle, you, you gave that date. Can you tell me when Jesus went into the most holy place? But by the way, we're going to prove all this. What did he go and do inside the most holy place? He, done, he, went, he never just go there for the sake of going there. He went to do a special work. He started the investigative judgment. Of the... Day of the day of atonement. But when it started the investigative the judgment of the dead. Amen. The judgment of the dead. The judgment of the dead. Now watch Revelations now, verse 15. When this angel sounds, tell me what apartment is my mind directed to and what is taking place inside this apartment. Let's see. Revelations eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded. That's the same angel we read in chapter 10. It says, and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world are become the kingdom of, of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. All right. Now watch, now watch verse 18. Watch verse 18. Tell me what's taking place now when this angel sounds. It says, and the nations were angry and the wrath has come. Watch this. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. Pause. What is taking place when the seven angel sounds? The judgment of what? The dead. the dead. Now, what apartments of the sanctuary are we in in verse 19? Yes, Brother uh, Gavin, you got a question? Yes, yes. There was a, maybe two or three studies ago yes. that someone said that Jesus returns at the sounding of the sixth angel. Oh, okay, 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 Brother Kevin. Here we are seeing that the seventh trumpet, or seventh trumpet, uh, the coming back at the sound yes. of the sixth trumpet. Okay, but you ride saying, with six. But how, 
how can he come back if the seventh trumpet is now taking place and it's being investigated? Amen, amen, amen. What we, what, we, what we refer to in the last study was at the sixth seal. See, the seals and the trumpets are different. Okay. At the sixth seal, he comes. The sixth seal, that's Revelation chapter 6. Now we're dealing with the trumpets. Okay. Yeah, the trumpets and the seals are different. Yeah, yeah. So he comes in the sixth, he comes in the sixth seal, but in the seventh trumpet, it announces the investigative judgments of the dead. Okay, you know what? Let's do this just to help you, Brother Kevin. If you read Revelation 8, verses 1, what seal is this in Revelation 8, verses 1? Revelation 6, Jesus is coming, but Revelation 8, verses 1, what seal is this? Seventh seal. When the seventh seal is open, what begins to be sounded? The seventh seal takes us almost back into history and then forward. What, what happens in the seven, when the seven seal is open? What does John see? Verse 6. Uh, oh, yes, you're right. There's silence in heaven. Actually, silence in heaven for half an hour. We'll study what's that half an hour in another time. We'll study that another time. That actually means heaven is empty, but only empty for an half an hour. We'll study what's that half an hour. Actually, that half an hour, when you calculate it, day, month, a day equals a year principle, you use that, you will see that half an hour is actually seven days. But, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that another time. But look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So when the seventh seal is open, it introduces to us the seven trumpets. trumpets. Yeah. So, and, and the trumpets take us back into history and then it takes us forward. Yeah. Takes us back and forward. So no thanks, thanks, thanks for the question because some people can think well, how is it that he comes in the sixth trumpet but seven trumpet introducing investigative judgments but it's actually the sixth seal and the trumpet is the seven trumpets different seals and trumpets. Yeah, no thanks. Now, so when the seventh angel sounds what is taking place according to verse 18? The judgment of the dead. Now someone, I want you to see now in verse 19. Tell me, which apartment of the sanctuary is our minds directed when the seventh angel sounds? Which apartment of the sanctuary? It says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and it was seen in his temple, take note, the ark of his testament. Question, which apartment did you just, just now you told me is the ark of the testament or the ark of the covenant? Which apartment? The most it's holy most place. Holy. So when the seventh angel sounds, automatically our minds directed to the most holy and as we direct today we see this judgment taking place of the dead can you tell me what year did this take place when god's people's minds were directed to the most holy and judgment began with it 1844 so when did the seventh angel start to sound 1844 can you see that when the bible says that the mystery should be finished when the seventh angel begins to sound i'm saying we're on borrowed time why because the mystery is not finished 176 years and the mystery is not finished we are on borrowed time i want you to see what's the mystery now how many in your bible to colossians colossians chapter one now this 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 verse was a, a theme verse in 1888 those who know Adventist history, there are two men that God used. I want you to see Colossians 1, verse 27. What is the mystery? It says, To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory, take note, of this mystery. We are talking about the same thing. Let's start at the verse again. It says, To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery amongst the Gentiles. What is this mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's the mystery of God? The mystery is that Christ must be in us, the hope of glory. Now someone says, what, is, what, what, what importance is that? Christ in me, the hope of glory. I want you to see, when Christ is in you, the hope of glory. By the way, Jeremiah 23, I believe it's verse 6, says his name 
is the Lord our righteousness. So if Christ is in us, we have in righteousness within us. Now I want you to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery of God, which ought to be furnished. What is the effect when Christ is in us, the hope of glory? I want you to see the effect of such a life when Jesus is in someone. How does that person look? How do they develop? Let's see the next verse. Verse 28. It says, whom we preach. Paul says, this is what I'm preaching about. I want this mystery to be accomplished. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. Now watch this. What is the effect of this mystery? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What is the effect of the mystery? That every man might be perfect. Perfection. So when the seventh angel sounds the mystery supposed to be accomplished, what is the mystery Christ in me? What is the effect? Perfection of Christian character. Now it's interesting. What is the book we are reading? What, what book am I reading from? What book is this? Who, who, who did Paul li- write this letter to? Can you see the, the, Col- the Colossians? Now, let me say this. For some of us who have knowledge, what church are we in prophetically, the name of the church? What church are we in? Laodicean church. That is the seventh church of the book of Revelation. Now, do you know that this message, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that we might present you perfect, is actually written to the Colossian church, but also to the Laodicean church? You say, how is that so? Now, question has anyone seen the Apostle Paul face to face here? Anyone? I'm saying, have you seen Paul, the Apostle, face to face? No one. I Look had at... a dream about it. No, <laughs> okay. <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> okay. What, what, watch this. Watch this. Look at the next chapter, verse 1. Tell me, who was this letter for? Besides the church of Colossians. Which church prophetically? Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Laodicea. Amen. Would that include you? Would that include me? Yes. It says, For would that you know how great conflict I have for you and for them that are at Laodicea. That's me and you. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Paul says, I'm writing to those in Laodicea who have not seen me face to face. That this letter is also for them. What does God want to accomplish within his lost day church? Perfection. 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 Now, remember, how is perfection? Many people struggle on this. How, is perf- how does perfection take place? How, how, how does this happen? We don't have to guess. We don't have to guess. The verse told us how it takes place in Colossians 1.27. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. I cannot attain to perfection in and of my own strength. No matter how long I strive and do all these things, I cannot attain it. How is it attained? It's humanity combining with divinity. Jesus dwelling with inside of me. Actually, you know what inspiration says? In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 180. Ministry of Healing, page 180. We are told, now by the way, before I share this quotation, Christ is divine, I am human. When the two blend, You know what is the effect? Ministry of Healing, page 180. Humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Someone says, well, but I've sinned. That's all it means. At that point, you broke your link with God. As long as humanity combines with divinity, she says, it cannot sin. And that's Bible. That's Bible. Now, my great question is this. How does God seek to teach us this wonderful, this wonderful lesson? Because perfection, Jesus is coming. Now, let me say this, friends. Do you know that, Sister Jen? And then I'll continue. Is this the way it's only 144,000 that's going to make it? <laughs> because it's a really, really hard task to you know, to accomplish, to be perfect like that. So, yeah. just wondering. Yes. Now, remember, Sister Jen, perfection is Christ living his life in me. Let me say this. Galatians 2.20 is actually, that, 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 I'm saying that is the ingredient to perfection. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
So I'm crucified with Christ. That means I am dead. I no more make decisions for my life. I no more choose. I'm going left. I'm going. Mm -mm. I, I am dead. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. That means I am not in charge of this life. I am dead. Crucifixion means I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I am crucified, well, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I love. So Paul says, I'm dead, but I'm alive. You say, how, is that? how, how can a man be dead and alive? He's going to explain. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I love. Yet not I. So he says, I'm dead, but I'm alive. Yet he says, it's not me that's living. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I love by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul says, I am dead. I no more, in Paul's mind, he says, I no more exist. The person that is living through me, in me, is Jesus. The decisions, the choices I choose, it's not the cho choices I want, but it's the choices God would have chosen or Jesus would have chosen had he been in my position in my life. That is the ingredients of perfection. It's surrendering the world to God. What, you say, what is the world? The world is the power of choice, the power of decision. It's giving that up to God and saying, Lord, I want you to choose for me. But nonetheless, God does not choose for you. God will say, this is the way I want you to walk in. He will say, walk here. But he still leaves me to make the decision to choose. So what are you saying? Perfection is not, it is simply the surrender of the heart to Jesus. The surrender of the world to Jesus. That brings us to perfection. Now, what was I saying? Oh, how does God accomplish this great work? You say, what is the great work? The great work of Jesus dwelling within me. How, I'm saying, how does he accomplish it? Or at least, what object lesson has he given me to teach me how he's going to accomplish this great work? Now, before I go there, before I go there, let me say this. That Jesus cannot come back until this work is accomplished. He cannot come back. Do you know that the Bible teaches us that? You know, you say, how do you know that? In Revelation chapter 14, we're going to study that. But in Revelation 14, from verse 6 to verse 9, is the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Now, after those messages are proclaimed, those messages do something to earth. The first, the second, and the third angel, it does something to the earth. And I want you to see what is Jesus is coming based upon. Come with me to Revelation 14 quickly. Before we go and look at um, where we are going. Revelation 14. Revelation 14. I'm going to read this verse and I want you to put on your thinking cap. I want you to, when I read this verse, tell me, based upon Revelation 14, and verse for Revelation 14, 14 and 15. Tell me, what is the second coming of Jesus hinged upon? It is hinged upon something. That means Jesus cannot come unless this thing takes place. You tell me if you can see it. Revelation 14, verse 14 and 15. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man. This is the second coming of Jesus. Having, in his, having on his head a golden crown... And in his hand, a sharp sickle. God wants to teach us a lesson of agriculture, but to get some spiritual lessons as well. Now, I want you to see in verse 15, Jesus is on the clouds coming back the second time. I want you to see in verse 15, tell me, what is his coming hinged upon? Verse 15, based upon the words of the angel. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Take notes what the angel says. Trust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. Take note, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Question, before, I, before a farmer, does he go into his field to reap with his sickle any time, or does he have to go at a specific time? Specific when the harvest is ripe. Amen. Thank you, sister. Only when the harvest is ripe can the farmer go in and reap. Question then, if Jesus is the great farmer, when can Jesus Christ come back? According, based upon scripture, based upon the words of the angel, what has to first take place upon planet earth in order for Jesus to come back and reap? The harvest has to be ripe. The harvest has to be ripe. 
Now, so, amen. The perfection of Christian. I'm saying amongst God's people, Satan knows this. He knows that Jesus cannot come. The, the second coming of Jesus, friends, is not hinged on any prophetic event. Someone says, but why do you spend time studying the prophecies? Because the prophecies indicate to me how close Jesus is in accomplishing this work. In other words, what I'm saying, oh, I hope you can get this. It tells me every prophetic event is a bell sounding. Do you know that the high priest on the border of his garments wore bell and pomegranates? Mm -hmm. That every time he moved in the sanctuary, the people could, they couldn't see him, but they could hear him move. And so the prophetic events are the movements of our great high priest telling me, as I see the events, oh, my high priest has almost accomplished his work. Why? We are almost nearing that great event. That event, when it happens, the mark of the peace, is an indication that God has a perfect church. I'm not saying the entire church is perfect, but I'm saying within his church, he got a people that are ready for the seal. So the crisis is hinged upon Jesus accomplishing his work in the sanctuary above. And we're going to study what is his work because Christ is working the sanctuary indicates my work on planet earth. If I'm a part of God's people, there's a special work he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary. Yes, sister? So this, for people who haven't studied the sanctuary, I just want to ask this yes. question so that they can understand. Yes. Um, so when this perfection is done, yes. will the harvest, will the, the children of God, will they know it? No. No. Let me sh show you why I'm saying no. Let me give you a Bible answer. Oh, friends, I could show you quotation, but let me just give you Bible. Let me give you Bible. Let me give you Bible. Never, as God's people, including the 144,000, will ever be able to utter the words, we are perfect. Mm -hmm. We have attained. Never, ever. Never, ever. Now, let me give you an example of this. God's going to say, they are perfect. Place my seal upon them. But they will never be able to utter it. Never, ever. I'm saying in this world, never will God's people utter, even when they have attained to it, we are perfect. I can show you the most holiest men in scripture that God declared with his own mouth. He said with his own mouth that this man is perfect. But when this man was asked, are you perfect? The man says, mm -mm, I'm not perfect. So you might say, well, well, what's happening here? Is God lying? Well, who, who's lying here? God's speaking the truth, but the man cannot see what God can see. Let me show you that. Come with me to Job. Let me just prove that. Come with me to Job. Come with me to the book of Job. Go into the book of Job. Job is um, before Psalms. Job chapter 1. Can someone just scan for me? Can someone scan for me? God's words concerning Job. Can you tell me what God says to Satan about his faithful servant Job in verse 8? God speaking to, say, to Satan. Can someone just read for me verse 8? What does God say about, to Satan about Job? And the Lord said unto one, Satan, chapter 1, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Okay, according to chapter 1, tell me, who said Job is perfect. Now question, can God lie? I can show you scriptures in the Bible that says God cannot lie. It, it says it's, Im, it's impossible for God to lie. What does God say about Job? He is perfect. Amen. Now let's go to the man whom God said is perfect. And let's ask Job. Job, can you please tell us, Mr. Job, are you perfect? <laughs> <laughs> let's see what Mr. Job says. Come with me to Job chapter 9. <laughs> Job chapter 9. I'm coming to you, Sister Kiwana. Let's just read this verse and then I'll take your hand. I'll take your hand right after this verse. Job chapter 9, verse 20. Watch the man. Watch the man. It says in Job 9, 20, If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Are you hearing what Job is saying? He says, I cannot say I'm perfect. He says, I will be proving myself to be perverse. So what I'm saying, the most holiest man, you know what? I can take you to Daniel. There's no record of Daniel's sin in the book of Daniel. Now, God don't hide people's sins, but there's no record of Daniel's sins. But do you know when Daniel prays in Daniel 9, Daniel says, I have sinned. We have sinned. 
Daniel confesses himself before God as a sinner. But there's no record. So what are we saying? We are saying the closer the man comes to God, I'm saying those who are the most closest to God have their eyes open. I'm saying it's like light. There's many things we cannot see. Even now there's, there's dust particles we cannot see because the sun is not shining at a specific place. But when the sun is shining just right into the room, you can see dust particles. And what I'm saying is, the further a man is from the light, the less, I'm saying he doesn't see as clear. The closer the man comes to God, the more clearly he sees. The more he sees himself as nothing. And I'm saying, for a man to ever proclaim he is perfect, in my mind, is just saying, the man is so far from God, he cannot see clearly. Mm-hmm. The closer you come, the more you see there's nothing good within me. You start saying what Paul says, in my flesh I know there dwelleth no good thing. You realize there's nothing good. And that if you are ever saved, it's by the matchless love of God. All your dependence is upon God. Yeah. So Job does, we will never be able to say we are perfect. Let me also say this. In great controversy, the 144,000 who give the loud cry, inspiration says, when they see how the world responds to the loud cry, she says they tremble. She says had she says had they calculated all what they would if they knew that the world's gonna make a death decree, they would have not proclaimed the message. They would have held their peace. And this is the hundred and forty four thousand. <laughs> so that's just something to think of. And even during the time of trouble, they are afflicting their souls. They are afflicting they're not afflicting their souls because they say, Oh, we're perfect. No. They're looking at themselves and they're saying, Lord, will I make it? Even though they got the seal, they gave the loud cry. They're saying, Lord, can I, would, would I make it? Now someone says, whoa, that doesn't make sense because we know the prophetic events. If they're giving the loud cry, if, they, if they're not, the plagues are not falling, then they should know they're saved. But think of this, beloved. The intensity of the crisis can cause that which was clearly presented prior to the crisis to actually re- be removed out of the mind. You say, what do you mean? Something which was presented prior to a crisis that when the crisis hits, you forget that information. You say, how is that possible? The intensity of a crisis can cause you not to remember, not so much not to remember, but many things become unclear to you. You say, what do you mean? Do you know that Jesus told his disciples prior to Gethsemane, prior to Calvary, he says, I'm coming out of the tomb alive. He says, I'm going to see you. He says, I'm going to meet you in such and such a place in Galilee. But do you know that when he went through the crisis, he could not see through the portals of the tomb. Do you know that hope did not present himself as Jesus coming off victorious? He cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb. The severity of the crisis, I'm saying, can, can, can cause us not to see clearly. And I'm saying even those who go through the crisis give the loud cry during a time of trouble. The severity of that time, the severity of that time, Cause those who even gave the loud cry, got the seal, they, they are afflicting their souls. They can't see through the portal of that crisis. They can't see through it. So God's people will never be able to utter the words, we are perfect, even when they do attain to perfection. And those who attain is the 144,000. Okay, Sister Emma, and then I'm going to take Sister Kiwana, and then we'll move on and conclude. If we don't have the right to say that we are perfect because... The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think that's what will always be on our mind, mm. that we have sinned through Adam. Mm. Sin entered the human family and has affected all of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm. Yes. Amen. Sister Kiwana, you, you had a question? Um, I was just going to say that Jeremiah said our hearts are desperately wicked who can know it mm. and that um and I was just going to say Job 9 verses 20 but also to um, God said um in Psalms 44 verses 21 shall not God search this out for he knoweth the secrets of the heart so I would say that um we cannot obviously say that we are perfect because um, we are so focused on Christ and obviously um, others will see that in us and that is how um, we all know 
And also it's a um, and also perfection is not self absorbed. So yeah. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sister Jim. And then we move on. Um, he's, sin cannot exist in heaven, right? Yet Moses and Elijah are there, and Enoch, right? So Moses, he wasn't exactly perfect, but he, <laughs> you know, and neither Elijah. So I'm, I'm assuming that it's God's, it's God's will to uh, forgive who and you know, whoever it is. If, even if we we think we're never going to be perfect, uh, that is his choice. You know, he knows our heart. Okay, <laughs> Sister Jen, what I'm going to suggest that in order to enter God's kingdom, it's perfection. There's not I, I, that's Bible, that's spiritual prophecy. Nothing short. Christ's object lessons 315. God requires perfection of His children. The law is the transcript of His character. The standard of all character. This infinite standard is revealed that none need be deceived of the kind of people God would have composed his kingdom. That's Christ's object lesson 315. I'm saying to enter God's kingdom is perfection, and she says nothing short. But then you might say, but this world is full of people that sin, and but some are going to be in the kingdom. Yes, that is true. You know what they need to enter the kingdom is perfection, and we do not have that to offer to God. But there is someone that if we give him his sins, he would give us his perfection. That his perfection can stand in the place of my imperfection, imperfect life. So, everyone who enters... Even, sorry? Oh, sorry. But even then, he didn't come until after, after Moses and after Elijah. So yes. that's why I said, you know, God... Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that, Sister Chad? Sister Chad, yes. Do you know that yeah. Moses and Elijah... And Enoch were on, you know, it's credit. I'm saying they were in heaven on credit. That if the credit was not paid at Calvary, they would have been expelled out of the kingdom of heaven. And that's why. They were on layaway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why, that's why when Jesus, when he was about to go into that crisis, God sent not an angel. God never sent angels. God sent Moses and Elijah to speak with him. To encourage him, Lord, we are, we, are, we are there in credit. And we need you to go through this crisis on our behalf for the human family. Moses and Elijah, that's why when God sent, he never sent an angel. He sent Moses and Elijah to tell him we are there. To, because of, by faith, we, we, we are there, Lord. So you are, please go through this crisis, not only for us, but for the human race. So they came to encourage him. They came to encourage him. Yeah, they were there in credit. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, friends. I'm not gonna finish. <laughs> okay. Let's let's take the address, Sister Emma. I just quickly I want to say yes. something. Add to what you said about how Moses and Elijah came to encourage Christ. It wasn't just Moses and Elijah. I think it's in the book Truth About Angels. Uh, an angel. I yes. think it must have been Gabriel. It was Gabriel. That came yes. From heaven. Yes. And he. And Christ was so weary and so exhausted mm. that the angel, the book says that the angel, the mighty angel mm. came and lifted his body up mm. from behind and pushed, uh, uh, lifted his head toward heaven and showed him heaven mm. and reminded Jesus that his father is there for him. Mm. Amen. Amen. Sister Sandra? Yeah, also in relation to whether the righteous will know whether they will make it or not also in the great controversy it tells us that um when jesus is about to come or maybe when he's already oh, wow. coming that um, the righteous will say who shall be able to stand because they don't know mm. you see they don't know and also the wicked will also utter that at some point as well yes. who shall be able to stand yes amen amen Okay, friends, let's, 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 let's round up. What I want us to do, maybe before I go on, just so that we, our minds can just come back, can you remember what the Bible says that, okay, based upon what we've looked at, when the seven angels sounds, sounded, God desired that the mystery should be accomplished. What is the mystery? It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. What is the effect? It's perfection. 
Can Christ come back without his people attaining perfection? We just saw in Revelations, that cannot take place. It cannot take place until the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's also in Christ's object lessons, page 69, we are told that Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced, then will he come to claim them as his own. So what is Christ waiting for? Just what Revelation 14 says, for the harvest of the earth to ripe. But Ellen White says it a bit differently. Same thing, but he's waiting for his character to be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then, so that happens, then he comes back to claim them as his own. Now, the great, I'm saying, our great mission, I'm saying as God's remnant people, is how is this work accomplished? We don't want to delay the coming of Jesus any further. We could do a whole study and show what sin does to the heart of Jesus. And I've even uttered prayers where I said, Lord, if I'm going to delay your coming, you'd rather put me off to sleep. Because there's only one thing that can delay his coming, that is sin. Amongst, not the world, the world's already in sin. It's amongst these people, amongst these people. But I want you to see, the whole purpose of the sanctuary is to teach us this one great object lesson. What's the object lesson? How God wants to dwell within humanity. When God dwells in humanity, that is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the, when that takes place, the effect of that is perfection. And I'm saying that the great purpose of the sanctuary is to teach me how God wants to dwell in humanity. That's the purpose. Like the sanctuary as a type or a symbol of, the, of, of our, I would say, our experience if we want God to dwell within us. Let's look at this. I want you to see that the sanctuary, God actually told him to make the sanctuary is because God wanted to dwell in the sanctuary amongst them. Let's just look at that verse. So it's how God, God says, if you make the sanctuary like this, like this, like this, I will dwell amongst you. How? By dwelling in the sanctuary. Let's see. And I'm going to suggest that our body is the temple of God. As the sanctuary, the literal sanctuary was there. Our body is also a sanctuary. God wants to dwell in us. But if we can study the sanctuary and see the object lessons in the sanctuary and we are willing to take those steps, then God can dwell in us as he dwells in the sanctuary. What will be the effect of that? Perfection. Perfection. Let's see this. Come on in your Bible to Exodus 25 verse 8. Exodus 25 Verse 8, very short, simple verse. Exodus 25, verse 8. It says in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary. Take note that I might dwell amongst them. So what God is saying here, because he can't dwell inside of his people, he says, make the sanctuary, let me dwell amongst you all. I can't dwell in you all because of sin, but let me dwell in the sanctuary, dwell amongst you all in the sanctuary. And by God's people studying the sanctuary, the great object lesson was how God, through studying the sanctuary, we see what caused God to dwell in the sanctuary. If you're willing to take those same steps, God will dwell within us. Now, let me just show you the verse that shows that we are also a sanctuary. Yes, um, is that... Brother or sister Tony. First, Second Corinthians six. Yes, you may speak. Good morning. Mo um, as you mentioned that day, um, it brings me back to Genesis because um, when 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 God created Adam and Eve, God was was dwelling face to face with, with, with man, right? So because of sin, mm. sin have caused the separation. So. In, in, in Exodus um, 25, verse 8, now mm. we say, Make me a sanctuary so mm. I can dwell amongst man now. Mm. And you know, that's why the whole plan of redemption is to get back that hope of glory in us and mm. um, Christ mm. in us mm. by fulfilling the plan of salvation. Amen. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to see where does God. The sanctuary is not his main dwelling place. Where is his main Where does he want to dwell? Take note where, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. 
And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Take note, you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them. Key, key, I will dwell in them. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So as much as the sanctuary was God's temple, his dwelling place, God says my original dwelling place is I want to dwell in you. And through me studying the sanctuary, I can see what caused God to dwell in that sanctuary. If I'm willing to take those steps, God is willing to dwell in me. That actually, that's where he wants to dwell. Now I want you to see this. Let me just pull out this quotation and then we want to just look at just one more point after this. And then we conclude. Just look at this quotation. Look at the prophet says, Ish. This is the Isaiah of Ages 161. Inspiration says, From the eternal ages, from the eternal ages. Mm, mm. That is, you know, friends, that can open up a whole study, specifically even with the sanctuary. From the eternal ages. Do you know what God created before he created any created being? He created the sanctuary. Before he creates the problem, he creates the solution. The sanctuary was going to be the solution for the problem of sin. So before he creates the problem, which would include... Now, I'm not saying that God caused problems by creating Lucifer. No, no. Lucifer chose himself to rebel. But before he creates the angelic host, he first creates the, the solution for the problem. And the problem was going to be sin. God foresaw it. But nonetheless, let's read it. From the eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraph to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. What did God design, his original design for man when he created man, even the angels, was that God would dwell with inside of us where we would be a dwelling place for God. What would be the effect of that? It's perfection. Now, how does God seek to accomplish this? How does he seek to accomplish it? It's through the study of the sanctuary. The object lessons, if you are willing to do what the sanctuary teaches, I'm suggesting that God would dwell within us. You know what? Maybe I won't go there. Let me, let's go here. Come with me. I want you to see this. Come with me, come with me to Exodus. Come with me to Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. This is talking about the sanctuary. I want you to see Exodus 40. Exodus chapter 40. This is talking about the sanctuary. The very thing I'm suggesting if we study, God can dwell within us and the mystery can be accomplished. Exodus chapter 40. I want us to see verse 17. Actually, no one. Okay, let's read from verse 17. I want you, as I'm going to read, please tell me what are you constantly seeing? Verse of the verse of the verse of the verse of the verse. What is constantly coming up? Let's see. Verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was read. Okay, it's telling us that the sanctuary was read, completed. Verse 19. And he, spread up, and he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent, up, up, tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 21. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 23. And he set the bread in order upon before. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 25. And he lighted the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 27. And he burned sweet incense thereon, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 29. And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered upon it burnt offerings and meat offerings, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 32. And they went into the tent of the congregation 
And when they had come near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. Please tell me, as we are reading through the sanctuary, uh, rearing of the sanctuary, what keeps popping up? What phrase keeps popping up? As the Lord commanded Moses concerning the putting of the sanctuary together. So as Moses is doing everything as God says in rearing the sanctuary, I want you to see the effect of that. What's the effect? Take note verse 34 and 35. We are talking about Christ in us, the hope of glory. It says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Take note. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What happened to the tabernacle? It was filled with the glory. But question, what if I read a... Whoa, 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 let me not say that. What caused God to come and fill the tabernacle? His glory entered into the sanctuary, boom, and he filled it. What caused God to do that? Sister Emma? Obedience to his requirements. Amen. In rearing up the sanctuary. So if I'm willing to do what the sanctuary teaches me, what's going to happen to me? Just based upon this, I'm going to be filled with the glory of God. And what is that called? Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the effect of Christ in you, the hope of glory, perfection? What does that mean? Jesus leaves the sanctuary. What does that mean for Satan? His time's up, his head is crushed, plan of redemption accomplished. All hinges upon the sanctuary. We need to understand what, 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 what powerful truth is taught here. So that I can come to this place and help with the completion of the work. So friends... There's more, but for the sake of time, I'm not, I didn't even finish. My study was short. I never get to all the verses, but we're going to come back. We'll come back. We'll come back, and we're going to look at the sanctuary. Sister Jen, and then we conclude. I just wanted to uh, uh, state what I noticed. Yes. I noticed that there are the heavenly sanctuary, there's a physical on earth sanctuary, yes. and then that's then there's the temple in us, the sanctuary yes. in us, right? Yes. And yeah. there's like three distinct bodies in one that makes up God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm. I'm wondering if there's some sort of connection to that. Why there's three <laughs> temples and why there's three separate people, you know? Uh, amen, uh, amen. amen, 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 amen. Um, I cannot say the connection, but what I'm going to say that the earthly sanctuary, we're going to look at that, was a shadow, a type of the heavenly. That means if I, now, let me say this, I cannot pierce, my eyes cannot pierce into heaven and see what Jesus is doing now. But through a study of the earthly sanctuary, I can understand exactly what Jesus is doing. You say, well, how do I know that? Because we will get there. I'll show you the verses. But the Bible says that the earthly sanctuary was a shadow of the heavenly. We're going to prove that Hebrews 8, 1, 2, verse 5. Now, what's a shadow? What is a shadow? I'm actually, what, what, what is a little shadow? Question. If, if, it if, reflects an image. Amen. What if, if you could see my shadow, yeah? And I would say, don't look at my hands. And I would hold up five fingers. I'm saying, don't look at my hand. I'm saying, if you could see my shadow. And I would say, only look at my shadow and tell me how many fingers. Would my shadow indicate what the original is doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. So by looking at the shadow, which is the earthly sanctuary, I'm going to be able to understand what is happening in the original, which is heaven. The heavenly sanctuary. Oh, on earth as it is in heaven. Also, um, the that body, the body temp, the, the body temple. Our, you know, when God wants to dwell in us, that's almost representative of Jesus Christ on earth, right? Like He was both divine and human that's at the same it. time. So Amen. I was, that's what I was thinking. Also, that's Amen. good. Oh, thank you. Amen. 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 So. I think we would stop here and um, God willing, Tuesday we, 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 will, we will resume on the sanctuary. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay, Sister Emma. Uh, yes. Will we be doing a study on the 144,000 specifically? Um, not, not, we, but we, we, we can, we, 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 we can, we'll try and do a study, but not, uh, it's not a part of this, but we, we would see, we would try and do a study. Yeah. Because the, yeah. I have a few questions in regards to the 144,000. Hmm. There is information going around that it's, um, 
um, it's a figurative number mm. and others say it's the literal number. So I think it would help to clarify um, this misconception among our people as to what their 144,000 actually is. Okay. 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 Who can <laughs> get that? Okay. No, it's fine. Um, let us pray. Let us pray. Um, yeah, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Loving Father, we just want to thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for the time, the energy, even the resources that heaven is currently using now for our salvation. And sometimes it seems to be almost a waste of resources, a waste of time, a waste of energy for the salvation of man, because we are so stubborn, but we just are so thankful, Lord, that you do not give up even when we pursue a course which is contrary to your will, but heaven is constantly seeking to save us. And Father, we need so much help. And thank you so much for the wonderful truth of the sanctuary, that if we are willing to do, if we are willing to heed the instruction we're going to receive, oh Father, we see what will be the effect. We saw what was the effect on the earthly sanctuary. And if we are willing to do the object lessons we learn, we would see what we will definitely experience the effect of Christ within us, the hope of glory. Please, Lord, this is our great longing. Our great longing is to gain victory over sin and to reflect your perfect character. Please, may you help us to the... As we go through these studies, may you really just make deep impressions on our hearts from this point forward. And that as we le learn the different challenging truths that will come to us, that you'd please, Lord, just give us a heart that is willing to do everything you say, so that Christ might dwell within us. Thank you so much for your love and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Please, Father, we are just pleading with you. May your spirit constantly work upon our hearts and keep these hearts tender and, and, and in a place where we are constantly hearing your voice. Prepare us for the closing scenes of this world's history. We know that we are living on the brink of the eternal world, that we have just but a few more years at the most before we witness with our own eyes the crisis which we have long prophesied. Please, Lord, help us as the curtain is about to be lifted. Eternity stretches out before us. Please have mercy upon us. Save this flock. Save everyone that is present on this platform. Save even those who will be viewing these studies. Please, may we all be amongst that special group that heaven is seeking to prepare. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Thank you for answering it as well. We love you and we ask these mercies humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing but all oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king. And I shall see him face to 